ammonium excretion and how ammonia is produced and uh, how ammonium excretion has an implication in correction of metabolic acidosis is the next concept. We already know that ammonium is produced in PCT and to write ammonia in the form of ammonia in the human body itself is wrong because ammonia in the human body at a physiological pH of 7.4 is going to exist as ammonium only as an implication of henderson hassel balke equation which we discussed already. And how ammonium is produced in the kidneys that is through glutamine. Where the glutamine is coming from? It is coming from the liver. And remember, your kidneys have infinite capacity. They are functioning normally. Your kidneys have literally infinite capacity to produce any amount of ammonia. That's not a problem because the source, the base product, the base substrate that's glutamine, it's infinite. A liver can produce any amount of glutamine. So kidneys can produce any amount of ammonia if they are functioning normally. So which means ammonium production and ammonia genesis is not at all a limiting factor in patients with metabolic acidosis. The limiting factor is the H plus secretion itself. Because I told you the distal nephron is the one that is the most important, especially the alpha intercalated cells in the distal nephron that's going to correct the metabolic acidosis and the H plus secreting capacity of the alpha intercalated cell even at its maximum is 700 millimoles per day. So that is the limiting factor, not the ammonia genesis in the patients with metabolic acidosis. So incidentally speaking, remember, Ammonium handling by the liver is through two mechanisms. One by producing glutamine, which is a non-toxic molecule. And second is producing urea, which is also a relatively non-toxic molecule at physiological levels. So ammonium handling by the liver is going to be in the form of either glutamine formation or urea formation, both of which is incidentally handled by the kidneys at the end. Okay. So how you are going to produce ammonium? As I told you, two enzymes are very important. First, glutamine to glutamate by PDG, phosphate dependent glutaminase which releases an ammonium molecule, then glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate by Pepsi K phosphenol pyruvate carboxykinase, which is going to yield another ammonium molecule. And it's believed that alpha ketoglutarate can further go to the liver and get converted to 2 bicarbonate, which is a little controversial. We're not talking about that right now. Okay, anyway, so two molecules of ammonium by metabolizing glutamine in the kidneys by proximal converted tubular cells. So now you know how ammonium is formed. Now how ammonium excretion is going to aid in metabolic acidosis or aid in correction of metabolic acidosis. We have two school of thoughts. First, I'm going to talk about the old school of thought, the traditional way of understanding uh, how ammonia corrects metabolic acidosis by a concept called as ammonium trap. Ammonium trap or ammonial trap. So by this principle, it's believed that ammonia is released from the PCT and because ammonia is a kind of non-polar substance, which means it's a lipid soluble substance, which means ammonia can freely diffuse anywhere in the kidneys. But the problem with ammonia, as I told, uh, according to henderson hassel balke equation at a physiological pH of 7.4, ammonia cannot exist as ammonia and it is actually trying to exist in the form of ammonium only. So, which means it's searching for that H plus molecule. It's searching for a proton to accept so that that physiological pH is pressurizing ammonia to combine with H plus to become ammonia. So, where you have the free H plus. Remember, in the proximal nephron, you do have the free H plus. You do have the free H plus in the proximal nephron, but the amount of free H plus in the PCT is very, very less. In the sense, most of the free H plus immediately combines with the bicarbonate and most of the H plus that is secreted in the proximal nephron is utilized for the process of bicarbonate reclamation. So this ammonia looks for that free H plus. Where is that free H plus? And that is present in the distal nephron. A lot of free H plus molecules will be present in the distal nephron. So ammonia gets excited. Ammonia immediately comes and binds with this H plus molecule. And it is believed that more the H plus in the distal nephron, which means in times of acidosis, more the H plus that is pumped out, more ammonia will bind to this H plus and it will become ammonium in the distal nephron. Once it becomes ammonium, it will no longer be able to diffuse freely across membranes because once you result in the ionic forms, we know ionic forms cannot diffuse across membranes easily. So that is a simple understanding in pharmacology itself and how the drugs are absorbed orally. So once ammonium is formed, it will remain in the urinary lumen only and will be excreted in the form of ammonium chloride. And this way of trapping this ammonia by H plus is what we refer to as ammonium trap. 
and this is the old school of thought very simple understanding elegant understanding but this is thought to be completely wrong because to say that ammonia is going to exist as ammonia all the way till it reaches the distal nephron or it finds it h plus in the distal nephron is completely wrong because uh, everyone has proved and it's believed that ammonia cannot be in ammonia form at physiological ph it should be produced itself in the form of ammonium only so this concept is wrong that it exists ammonia till it reaches the distal nephron that's wrong so that's why we have the current model which is the most accurate which says that ammonia is produced in the ammonium form only which means you are going to produce ammonium in the pct and the pct is going to secrete ammonium actively into the urine and this ammonium that is secreted in the urine will be carried by the urine all the way to the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle where ammonium will be absorbed, reabsorbed by the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle cells by the same loop diuretic sensitive transporter that is NKCC2. It's going to absorb the ammonium. Once ammonium is absorbed, it's going to get concentrated. It's going to get concentrated in the medullary interstitium and who is concentrating ammonium in the medullary interstitium by the cells of the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And the distal uh, tubular cells can take up this ammonium as and when required. And this uptake of ammonium from the basolateral side and pushing of the ammonium into the urine on the uh, epical side, both are actually mediated by a very important transporter called as RHCG. This could be an example. Now, RHCG is a very important transporter that mediates the uh, uptake of ammonium and pushing into the urinal lumen by the distal tubular cells. Okay, RHCG transporter. And once ammonium is in the urine, it will be eliminated as ammonium chloride. Fine. So what is the advantage of eliminating ammonium in this situation? So, why you need ammonium to be eliminated in this way? So, and what advantage it provides in patients with metabolic acidosis? So, remember, as I told you in metabolic acidosis, there will be massive production of H plus and massive excretion of H plus in the distal nephron. And there is a danger that your urinary buffers will get saturated and the urine pH can reach a limiting value of 4.4 uh, relatively faster in patients with metabolic acidosis because the urinary buffers will get saturated. So, you need to prevent this urinary pH from uh, reaching that value of 4.4 and you maintain urinary pH at a higher value so that your H plus excretion happens without any hindrance and it happens unampered. So, that's why ammonia is secreted. Still confused. Ammonia is an alkaline molecule. So, if ammonia is secreted into the urine, it actually dilutes the pH. That's the idea. In the sense, it will not allow the urine pH to reach that 4.4. Even if you secrete so much of H plus, doesn't matter. Relatively, the tubular cells will take up more ammonium and secrete more ammonium. So that it, it kinds of dilutes the pH because it's an alkaline molecule. So it will not allow the urine pH to reach that 4.4 value. So that your H plus secretion can happen at full capacity in the distal nephron. That's why your ammonium production and secretion will not at all be an issue in patients with severe acidosis. It's the capacity of distal nephron itself is going to be the limiting factor in patients with severe metabolic acidosis. That is the final take This is the most modern understanding and the most correct understanding of how the kidneys handle ammonia. Okay, it's not produced in ammonia form. It's going to be formed in ammonium only where it is secreted by the PCD into the urine taken up by the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle and concentrated in the middle intersection which is further taken up by the distal tubular cells and excreted in the urine in times of severe metabolic acidosis. And as you move to this particular graph, you can see initially up to a certain level, your phosphate buffer becomes very important. But after a point of time, your phosphate buffer uh, kind of gets saturated. And uh, at uh, particular urine pH, your creatine buffer also becomes very active. And you can see creatine buffer keeps increasing. But at one point, it also figures out. And then you have the citrate buffer, which is also important at low urine pH. And uh, it tends to buffer H plus to some extent, but finally comes the ammonia. Ammonia excretion will keep increasing 
as the H plus excretion increases. As the urine pH drops further and further and further, your ammonium excretion will keep increasing. And remember body and kidneys especially has infinite uh, capacity to produce ammonia if the kidneys are functioning normally. So ammonium production in the kidneys is not a limiting factor in severe metabolic disorder. It's always the H plus secretion that's going to be the limiting factor. So maximum secretion capacity of uh, distal nephron is going to be 700 millimoles per day. That's a point that you need to know. This is a very important graph that helps you understand so many things. And severe acidosis and severe alkalosis per se can have significant effects on the proper functioning of organ systems. First, let us see the effects of severe acidosis, especially at a pH of less than 7.2 and its negative effects on the organ systems. Coming to the cardiovascular system, it's going to result in significant myocardial suppression and poor contractility and arterial vasodilation and as a result, it can result in low mean arterial pressure and cardiac output. And as I told you in the previous lecture, acidosis can significantly impair the response to vasopressors and catecholamines. So correction of acidosis, of course, results in improved response to your vasopressors and catecholamines. So once you correct acidosis, your vasopressor dose in patients with shock will come down. And significant increased risk of cardiac arrhythmias is there because of acidosis. And coming to respiratory effects, hyperventilation is a very, very important compensatory mechanism for metabolic acidosis and paradoxically severe acidosis itself can reduce the respiratory muscle strength and it can negate the patient's effort to correct the acidosis by hyperventilation and coming to the metabolic effects hyperkalemia is a well-known side effect of metabolic uh, acidosis we have discussed that already in the hyperkalemia chapter in the endocrine system and of course insulin resistance can happen and especially in patients who are having acidosis your insulin requirement will be very very high that's why in patients with early diabetic ketose doses, the dosage of insulin will be very high. As the acidosis corrects and the decay starts correcting by itself, the amount of insulin needed to reduce the glucose will be very, very low. So that's an important point to understand. And coming to the CNS effects, altered mental status is the most important CNS effect as far as acidosis is concerned. Coming to alkalemia, especially at a pH of more than 7.6, it can cause significant Arterial vasoconstriction can reduce the coronary blood flow, can cause severe myocardial ischemia, and of course, it again increases the risk of arrhythmias like your metabolic acidosis. And uh, one of the important compensatory effects of metabolic alkalosis is going to be the hypoventilation. And uh, coming to the metabolic effects, uh, metabolic alkalosis can result in a number of hypos like hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypophosphatemia. And CNS effects. Most important altered mental status and you can result in the development of seizures not just because of alkalosis because of the electrolyte disturbances because of alkalosis and tetany again because of hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia because of underlying metabolic alkalosis. So important effects of acidosis and alkalosis in the human body especially if it is severe enough. <music>